So please. Okay, uh, I would like to introduce our, our special lecturer for today. Um, and he is going to be giving a talk in honor of the, the late Steven Weinberg. This is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Fernando uh, Corverdo uh, Rodriguez. I'm hoping I pronounced that right, although I probably didn't. Uh, Dr. Fernando um, uh, is uh, director of the Abetas International Center for Theoretical Physics. He uh, received his PhD from UT Austin under the direction of Dr. Steven Weinberg. He has uh, worked in research centers such as um, CERN, McGill University, the Institut de Physique de Nuschle, Switzerland, and also at Los Alamos National Lab. He's won several awards, including the Royal Society Wilson Mer uh, Research Merit Award. He's won, uh, gotten distinguished um, uh, honorary doctorates from Universidad de San Cal um, Carlos de Guatemala and Universidad de Vela de Guatemala. And he is the John, um, he also got a fellowship from the John Solomon Guggenheim uh, Foundation and is uh, shared the 1998 ICTP prize with Armedia Font. So uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Corviero. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Just to correct, uh, I, I, I just, I'm a professor at the University of Cambridge in England, and that's my main position. I just finished being the director of ICTP last, uh, two years ago. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to honor Steve. Uh, it was a great loss for, for physics, and I have a, a great memories of, of him when I was his graduate student and over the years. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased that you're honoring him. Um, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> anyway, so let, let me start with some personal uh, reminiscences of Steve. And uh, I will try to go very quickly, uh, uh, kind of overview about his impact in high energy physics in general. So let me just... Let me try to see. Okay. So when you talk about Steve, you have to talk about the standard model first because he was probably, we many of us claim that he's probably the most important physicist of the last 50 to 60 years, which is that's, that's the, 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 the perspective that we have about him. And he has his impact on each, each, each of the parts of the standard, what we call the standard model of particle physics. So since I know the the audience is mixed, so I will go quickly. The standard model is just the basic theory, the fundament most fundamental theory that we have to describe all the particles and interactions that we know in nature. Um, so the basic elements are the quarks and leptons, are particles. They all have spin one half. So the, and they, 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 that's the spin one half particles. It means that they call the matter particles. They transform the, some particular representations of a symmetry group, the SU3, SU2, and U1. And the, the interactions are mediated by spin one particles. Uh, the strong interactions are mediated by the particles called the gluons, the weak interactions by Ws and Z bosons, and the electromagnetic interactions by the photon. And uh, on top of that, we have a Higgs particle, it's been zero, and I can see a profile of what the Higgs is, it's a scalar, so it, has, it can have a profile. And this is a picture of the famous discovery of the Higgs uh, in uh, 2012. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, then, uh, then there is the graviton. The graviton has a spin two. We can only describe it on what is called an effective field theory, just in, uh, in, in terms of a, a theory in, in some in expansion of, of uh, energy expansion. But uh, contrary to the other interactions, everything that everything is totally fully understood quantum, quantum mechanically. The quantum gravity is only understood as an effective field theory so far. And we stop with the spin two. No, we don't go beyond that. So essentially that's the whole picture and it's surprising and incredible that describes the universe that we have observed. So, so let me go, try to go to what Steve Weinberg had to do with all this. And uh, his production span over eight decades, which is already something very impressive. So I go decade by decades and start with the 1950s. 
So he was a young person and already made important contributions in, in quantum field theory. I have chosen uh, kind of 20 articles from Steve, just to give you an idea. They are kind of renowned articles. That means that each of them has more than 500 citations. And I only picked less than half of, the, of those from, from, from his production. So that should give you a, an idea of how important uh, the impact that he had over, over the field. So I hope to, to give you an idea of, of, of some of the highlights. So in already in, as, as a young person with important contribution to field theory at very high energies and generalizing already results of Dyson and Salam. These are uh, articles which are uh, quoted today, even if they were written in the 1950s, just to show you how important they were. Uh, and go to the 1960s, and then 60s and 70s will be probably the longer uh, decades that I will talk. And it starts with a big paper. This is a uh, classic already. It's, uh, it's called Broken Symmetries, and the authors are Goldstone, Abdul Salam, and Steve Weinberg. So I know the, uh, the history of this paper. I had actually, I had the position of Abdul Salam a couple of years ago in the institute he created. They were very good friends with uh, Weinberg. Uh, Salam invited Weinberg to spend one year in, in um, Imperial College in London. Before going there, Weinberg had uh, met uh, uh, Goldstone in MIT, and they had discussed about this result that Goldstone had. And the idea is very simple, and I will try to describe it here. Uh, <clears throat> you have a, a, a scalar field, a complex, so you have the two dimensions and the potential. Uh, if it is, uh, the, it has a scalar potential, which is quartic, a quartic polynomial, so it has, and being positive and, 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 and asymptotical, so, there are only two options that it takes this shape. Is, you have this the symmetry, this spherical symmetry here. So it has this shape or this other one. Here you can see the symmetry with a circular, and then the minimum has the same symmetry as the theory. So this is the, where the, uh, the, the theory says to be the, the symmetry is unbroken. And uh, the curvature of this potential give you an idea of the masses of these particles. So there are two particles because it's a complex field. And both are massive because the curvature is, 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 is non zero. Whereas this other, this is the, the other option is the potential looks like this. Now, the, the symmetric point is a maximum, it's not a minimum. And the minimum is actually not symmetric because you can move around from the circle. So there are many minima. And uh, so, again, the curvature of the potential in this direction is non zero. So there's a massive particle. But in this other direction, uh, it is flat. So the particle, corresponding particle, is massless. And that's what is called the Goldstone boson. Uh, so what Weinberg, Salam, and Goldstone managed to prove that this is a totally general result for any theory with the global symmetries, continuous global symmetries, when the symmetry is spontaneously broken, like in this case, there are always massless particles. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very important. And at that time, it was a negative result because then these particles had not been seen in, in nature. So then this was a result uh, uh, against theories with uh, continuous global symmetries. Okay. Let, let leave this for uh, aside for a second. And then uh, I will discuss this little bit complicated slide, which I think is very, very deep. So I will spend a couple of minutes on this. So again, in the 60s and 64, Weinberg considered a general scattering process. You have uh, incoming particles, outgoing particles interacting in the middle. and uh, then he is, uh, I mean, this is a, a computer, but it's called what is called the S matrix. Uh, and then using only quantum mechanics and a special relativity, so the symmetries of the Lorentz invariance, he managed to prove very important results, which is he just assumed that in the same process, now to each of the, of the outgoing or incoming particles, you can attach a particle of spin one massless, like a photon, and, and with a very small momenta. And you do that for every single particle which is coming and outgoing. And then just uh, imposing these principles, I told you, the, knowing that this particle interact with the corresponding uh, particles that are, which are here, he managed to find that, that the couplings between the, 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 this photon-like particle and, and, and the matter fields, uh, they have this satisfy this con condition where the sum of some of the couplings of the, uh, of the incoming particles, it was the same with the couplings of the outgoing particles. And these couplings are precisely what we can call uh, electric charge, the corresponding particles of photon. And this is just a statement, a general proof 
of charge conservation, which is impressive. Just imposing minimum principles, uh, scattering matrix, and Lorentz invariance, and you get a deep result, which is charge conservation, uh, without the need of any other assumptions. <clears throat> he then go ahead of that, and they say, well, let's see that it, instead of having a photon, a particle of spin one, let's put a particle of spin two. That's like the what we call the graviton now, and do the same trick. And then the condition that he got is not this one, but he gets a slightly uh, more complicated expression where now the momenta of the corresponding particles are involved. And uh, so he already knew that momentum, the, about momentum conservation. So he knew that the sum of the incoming momenta minus sum of the outgoing momenta is zero. And so the, the only way that this equation can be satisfied is if all the FIs now are a constant. So this is a there is a universal coupling. All the particles couple in the same way to the spin two particle. And that's a proof of the equivalence principle. So this principle that is, has been so key to understand gravity from Galileo to Einstein, Weinberg could put, prove it in this simple way and uh, with, with this uh, 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 standard result just using principles of special relativity and quantum mechanics. He went, even went beyond that and said, well, what about particles of higher spin? Let's put the spin three or spin four or something. And he got constraints that the constraints will have higher powers of momentum, which, which were impossible to satisfy. So he immediately concluded that you stop as, uh, at spin two. So, and then as I showed you in the previous slides with the standard model, that's where nature stops. We don't have interactions mediated by particles of spin higher than two. So, which is a beautiful result. And he's expanded on other papers on this and he derived, for instance, Maxwell's equations and Einstein's equations just using this. So he didn't need to use all, all the, the geometric uh, uh, arguments of uh, Einstein at that time. So this is a very important result. And for your curious, these are called soft theorems that are very, very popular now. Then he went and studied uh, properties of, of uh, strongly interacting particles and he described some what is called Weinberg's own rules. So the, uh, rules related to the masses of the spectrum of different particles that are satisfied for strong interactions and, and they're uh, uh, tested experimentally uh, uh, in the positive way. Then this is a, an important paper also, chiral perturbation theory. Uh, he knew that the Goldstone bosons were not observed in nature, so he wanted to use symmetries. He knew that there were symmetries in nature that were not exact like uh, isospin, isospin related the proton and the neutron, it was not an exact symmetry because they behave differently on their uh, electric uh, magnetic interactions, but it was an approximate symmetry. So he said, well, if there's an approximate symmetry, the corresponding Goldstone bosons will not be exactly massless, but it may be light. So that's what he called pseudo Goldstone bosons. And precisely the pion, the, the strong interacting particle, which is much lighter than all the other hadrons, fits in precisely into this. And then he proposed that the pine will be a pseudo Goldstone boson. And then having an understanding of, of the strong interactions in that uh, with approximate symmetries. So this is a key paper. Then in 1967, this is uh, the outstanding paper that everybody talks about when we talk about, about Weinberg. It's called a model of leptons. And uh, it has only two and a half pages long, and probably is, it is hard to find any other document in nature with so much information as this simple paper. So at that time, Higgs and others have come out with what is called the Higgs mechanism, in the sense that a way to evade the problem of, of, of the Goldstone bosons that Weinberg uh, and Salam and Goldstone have uh, uh, found, they say, well, that was a property of global symmetries. What about local symmetries? That symmetries that are uh, uh, <clears throat> symmetry point by point in the, independently. And in that case, there's a, a, a nice way to, to, to solve the problem of the Goldstone bosons because uh, the corresponding, if there is a symmetry is local, there is a gauge field like the photon. And uh, um, then the corresponding, if the symmetry is broken, the corresponding Goldstone boson uh, will be absorbed by this gauge field. That a gauge field, a massless gauge field has two degrees of freedom and a massive one has three degrees of freedom. So the, when you break the symmetry, the corresponding massless bos uh, gauge boson eats or absorbs the, 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 the one single degree of freedom of the Goldstone boson and becomes massive. So in that sense, that explains, that describes the theory with a massive gauge field and, and there are no Goldstone bosons left because it the, the, is only the longitudinal component of this massive field. So nature can behave like that. And so Weinberg used that general approach of Higgs and company to, uh, describe the weak interactions. So remember at that time, 
the only interaction that people were able to describe was electromagnetic interactions uh, by the result of uh, Tomonaga, Schinger, and uh, Feynman. And uh, so now Weinberg made a, the next big step. You can describe in another interaction out of the four. Now we have electromagnetism and weak interactions being described in a consistent manner. He didn't stop that way, and there he only he also realized that by 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 in, in his proposal for describing weak interactions, you have to start with a symmetry that at the end there is a remnant symmetry left, and that symmetry describes electromagnetism. So with his approach, he also described uh, not only the weak interactions but also weak interactions with electromagnetism. And so in that sense, he unified the two interactions, and you can compare that with what uh, Newton did comparing. Uh, uh, gravitational interactions on Earth and, 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 and in, in, in space, or what Maxwell did with elect unifying electricity and magnetism. So this is uh, as, as big as it is, because he managed to unify these two other, two other interactions. He made a prediction, then what is called neutral currents, interactions mediated by, by a, a neutral particle. And that was enough for him to get the Nobel Prize. Uh, Salam did a similar work later on, and they shared the Nobel Prize also with, with, with Glashow, who had done previous work in, in other directions. Um, and on top of that, he predicted that there should be these particles mediating the weak interaction that had to be massive because of the, the Higgs mechanism. And he predicted the existence of W plus, W minus, and the Z particles, the neutral currents, and also the Higgs. I was lucky enough that I was his student when he, they discovered these three particles in the 1980s. He already had a Nobel Prize. <laughs> And on top of that, they discovered these three particles. And it's impossible to forget the moment when he came and told us about that discovery. He was, of course, very happy. And we were all extremely excited to listen firsthand that they had discovered his particles. I had a similar feeling many years later when I was at CERN and the, uh, to see what the announcement of the discovery of the Higgs particle. And uh, uh, I can imagine only uh, how Steve was feeling at that time, because the Higgs particle is called the Higgs. But the one that was discovered at CERN is the Higgs particle predicted by Weinberg. There may be many other Higgs particles satisfying the Higgs mechanism, but the one that has been discovered in nature, the, the, what is called the Higgs boson for the standard model, is the one that predict, was predicted by Weinberg. So you can see the great success of this paper. Okay, let me book quickly to the 1970s. He described, uh, he had to describe the, the, the strong interactions. People had already understood that the strong interactions what had this property called asymptotic uh, freedom, and that they were getting weaker and weaker with the scale, and then that the quarks were uh, confined, and that you couldn't split the quarks because when you try to split them, that you, you, could, you could create also part, a pair quark on the quark. But also the gluons who were the mediators of that interaction. Weinberg argue <clears throat> that that uh, um, that 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 they were confined also. So that what that's in, and that of course that is manifested in the standard model. He also found, together in a paper with one, a, a limit in temperature in nature. You have the, the number of degrees of freedom increasing with energy, and that's precisely what happens in string theory. And that's called the Hydron tr transition, that is, is Hydron temperature, which is uh, still an important uh, limit in temperature that, that we know that something will happen after that, and we don't know what the, what what uh, what is the, that transition, the, uh, the what is the phase that is after the the Hydron temperature. He also studied uh, uh, field theory of finite temperature. And, and he established that in gauge theories, the once you, 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 you can describe them with a finite temperature, then at finite temperature, the symmetries can be restored. And you have a potential like this, a finite temperature, uh, a high temperature where the symmetry is, is unbroken. And when they, you cool it down, the symmetry, the potential changes, and you get a broken symmetry. Okay. That's important for cosmology because we, we, then we can say, okay, so the symmetry is there. Why is it uh, broken? But it was it was not broken in the early universe because it was very hot, and now it was broken. It, it is broken now because we are living at the late uh, late stages of the universe. So thinking about this, then he came with this key paper with uh, Georgia and Quinn. Uh, it's about what is called grand unification. After the standard model was understood, that was uh, 1974 now, uh, Salam and Patti came with the first article about beyond the standard model, just having more symmetries beyond the standard model. And then um, Georgia and Glasher also uh, proposed all other symmetries. Uh, but Weinberg came with this idea, of course, if there's a bigger symmetry at high energies, then 
the, the strong interactions that we know that they, they change with energy like this, they get weaker and weaker with energy. He said also the, the weakened electromagnetic interactions also change with the energy. And then he says at some point they may meet. And when they meet, they will have one single strength and that will be one single interaction. And that's the real meaning of unification. And that's, uh, that's the, the, what they computed in this paper with uh, Queen and, and Georgia. He, I will go quickly. He also, uh, with his student Gildner, uh, realized the problem, what is called the hierarchy problem that has been the basis for many people to, to build this, this uh, colliders in, uh, at, at the TV energy because uh, there's an issue about why the mass of the Higgs is so light and has to be understood, especially now that it's discovered. And he raised that problem. He also came out with another solution, which is called Technicolor. Unfortunately, it's essentially ruled out at the moment because of, 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 the, of the discovery. After the discovery of the Higgs, is, 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 uh, he proposed that the Higgs will be a composite particle, but uh, it doesn't fit very well with the experiments. He entered cosmology in the found uh, bounds on the neutrinos due to uh, cosmological bounds on neutrinos or the masses of the neutrinos. He had this important paper with Sterman about how to detect uh, the effects of quarks that you cannot see them in isolation. You can detect them um, by, by the jets that they produce in, in E plus and minus collisions. And so he described the property of the jets and the angular distribution and so on that fit with the experiment. And that's the way that people can see that quarks have been uh, uh, tested experimentally. Then he came out with this beautiful idea about the particles called axions. This now is beyond the standard model. We, they have not seen axions, but it's one of the main candidates to be observed in the next few years. Uh, so one of the best candidates for dark matter, appears in string theories. Or it's, it's, and Weinberg came out with a very simple uh, uh, proposal after, after a proposal of Peche Queen to solve what is called the strong CP problem in the standard model, in, in strong interactions. This is the, the, the gauge fields of the strong interactions. There is this parameter theta. It had to be very small, and a way to make it very small is to change it by field. And at the end of, of the day, if the field is minimized at zero, that means that this parameter is small. And Weinberg identified, okay, that field should be an observable uh, um, particle, and that is a, a scalar, it's a pseudo scalar. It's contrary to the Higgs, that is a scalar, this is a pseudo scalar, and that should be, uh, that should, be, should solve this problem. And of course, if actions are detected, he will have been a candidate for another Nobel Prize. He had very important uh, contributions in what is called effective in theories. He essentially changed our way of thinking in terms of what we call, what is, what is a field theory that is, that is reliable. So we, at some point people thought that only renormalizable field theories were reliable because you can, there were very small uh, number of parameters and you can have all the corrections were only correct in these three parameters. And, and then you can be predictive. Whereas is, if you have higher order, uh, what's called non-normalizable uh, couplings, then you have to continue, consider an infinite number of them. However, Weinberg pointed out that, of course, each of these terms are there, but they come with scales because at the end of this, the, the whole dimensionality of the Lagrangian has to be dimension four. So, and these scales can be uh, bounds if, they, if they're very heavy, very, uh, then this term is suppressed compared to this one and so on. So you can, depending on the level of precision you need, you can stop in that series in a finite number of terms and, and, and be predictive. And that's the, the basis of what's called effective field theories. And that's the way that we understand nature at the moment. Using this effective field theory, you've had uh, beautiful uh, uh, ideas and the same use. You have said the Lagrangian, the standard model. Let's add the first. And he said, what is the dimension five operator that you can add? It happens to be this one, which is Higgs, Higgs, neutrino, neutrino. Then it has to come with the one of the mass. And if, you, if the Higgs has a, a value in, in, in the vacuum, this will give mass to the neutrinos. So we know the neutrinos are very light. So that from doing that, we can just compute what, what the bound on this mass is. And he said, well, whatever the physics that produces the mass of the neutrinos, it has to be at, at energies very high, 10 to the 14 GeV, which is many orders of magnitude beyond the 10 to the 3 GeV that we are exploring now at CERN. So he does the same thing with dimension six operators. So he finds quark, 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 lepton, lepton and that will produce, uh, induce proton decay. And then he said, since the proton hasn't decay, then you can have a bound on these masses. So it's, that's a way of understanding now physics beyond the standard model in this way, using effective field theories. Let me move quickly. In, in the 1980s, he had something, one of the few proposals for making consistent quantum theory of gravity by uh, what's called asymptotic safety, in the sense that gravity, all the interactions 
change with energy, but at some point it may be a fixed point on the on, on the normalization group, say. And if there is this fixed point, then gravity can be consistent. And people are still playing with this idea. And he moved to supersymmetry in the 1980s, uh, gravitino cosmology, supergravity. I, that's what I remember very well because that's what I started being his student. And he had a beautiful paper about understanding superconductivity from um, particle physics in the sense that he defines a superconductor like a a material in which the, the U1 of electromagnetism is broken. And so that means the corresponding photon is massive. And from that, only assuming that he can describe using the techniques of uh, field theory in particle physics, and he can derive the superconducting properties of the material, the Meissner effect, the sense, et cetera, which is a beautiful paper. In the 87, he had a classical review. This is the, the, the paper to really you want to understand the cosmological constant problem. Identified as one of the as probably the most the biggest puzzle in nature, and he he had a lot of important uh, results here which are original. And a year later, or, the, or that year in eighty seven, he came up with a very uh, bold prediction, which is uh, if there are anthropic arguments to 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 explain why the cosmological constant is almost essentially so small, um, that, that that they could be tested experimentally, and, and he essentially predicted. That, that the cosmic constant should be very, very small. And that, of course, uh, in 87, and of course, dark energy was discovered 10 years later. So this can be, a, and he's saying with, an, with the scale that he was predicting. So in that sense, uh, that shows how, how great a physicist he was. Uh, he also came out with ideas about how to experimentally test quantum mechanics, just how to test the principle, the uh, superposition principle. Uh, then in the 1990s, Effective field theories in nuclear physics that made a huge contribution to nuclear physics. The same arguments of effective field theories applied to, to low energies in, in nuclear physics, and he managed to make a bunch of predictions and modify the field. In the 2000s, effective field theories in cosmology, inflation, and so on, that, uh, that uh, he, 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 he described using his own techniques. In the 2010s, uh, proposals of uh, 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 Goldstone buses to explain what is called delta NF, which is what is called dark radiation. It's another potential mystery for, from, from the standard model of cosmology. Uh, and then more recently, he worked in models of leptons and quark masses. Uh, he had his last paper probably was massless particles in extra dimensions. He had been very much concentrating uh, efforts in, in understanding the foundation of quantum mechanics in the last few years. And more recently, working in some aspects of gravitational waves, so that show you how active he was, even at age eighty-eight. I cannot mention Weinberg without mentioning his textbooks. So he had a collection of textbooks which are on parallel. Nobody can compare with Weinberg on his textbook. There are the classical textbooks on on all that. I, I just to give you an idea, the last book, the textbook on quantum <clears throat> on modern physics, I received it the day he died. So it was it's, it's a July edition. So he was active until the last minute. And of course, the popular science books that would also make a, a huge difference between him and any other physicist. So the first three minutes is the way that many of us learn cosmology, even though it's a popular science book. Dreams of a Final Theory probably is, is a, one of the deepest um, books uh, written in popular science. And I'm sure it will be quoted by people in a hundred years or so. He had some advices for young students that I will skip. I have some personal reminiscences in the sense that I mean, his lectures were outstanding. As a supervisor, I admire him the, uh, the most. He supported very much my career. He has several anecdotes that I have no time to, to discuss. Uh, he supported me and, and my role as director of ICTP, which I, I appreciated very much. Actually, one of the, my greatest treasures is uh, having a five minute video that he recorded for my 60th birthday that I, I have it as a. And then we have an unexpected collaboration. Uh, Joe Polchinski, that many of you may remember also, who was a, in, a professor in Austin, he was also my lecturer, he died uh, uh, young. And then I, I joined Steve and Rafael Bosa to write a biographical memoir of uh, Joe Polchinski uh, only last year, we, we, we put it together. Um, so there are many quotes from Steve that people will remember. I'm sure people, all the people who will talk about Steve will mention this. I have my favorite that I have in my lectures on the standard model, I will just mention this one which is the purpose of theoretical physics is not to describe the world as we find it, but to explain it in terms of a few fundamental principles, why the world is the way it is. So that's, that's, that's essentially describing what we do in particle physics. So with that, I will thank you and let me just leave you with an image 
of a Steven Weinberg, the human being. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. I think I could speak for everyone here. I say that was an excellent presentation. Um, we do have a couple minutes uh, because like I said before, we're gonna delay the uh, parallel sessions for a little bit. Um, we do have some time if anybody wants to ask a question or two. And if you ask me the question, I'll repeat it so the speaker can hear. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've raised my hand, <clears throat> okay. um, but I'll just speak. Um, uh, excellent talk. Um, and uh, given our difference of time zones and continents, it wouldn't surprise me if you didn't hear my talk this morning. Um, but um, I talked at uh, rather great length uh, about the Anthropic Likelihood paper that I wrote with Steve and leading up to it, his review and the 87 paper. So I want to point out a misconception which is universal and your uh, expertise is so overwhelming in every other respect that I would like you to be um, uh, clarified. Um, his 87 paper served um, a very important purpose of raising the anthropic likelihood question, but all he did there was to determine the lower limit for suppressing galaxy formation for the uh, amount of vacuum energy density compared to matter density. And uh, his argument at the time was that if galaxies exist, then the cosmological constant can't be above that. Um, and he already knew that quasars existed at a rate shift of four, which meant that there was already a factor of more than 100 times the mean density today or the critical density by which um, the cosmological constant would have to have been elevated in order to um, prevent the earlier formation of quasars. Um, and he was rather disappointed by that because if we already knew that quasars existed at a redshift of four, and if you already were orders of magnitude above what we knew to be the practical limit, then the anthropic reasoning would say you could have been anywhere all the way up to many hundreds of times the current mean density. And so it, it was uh, a weak, it was a, an argument against the utility of the anthropic reasoning. Now he came back in when the cosmological constant problem, sorry to be going on, but this is so important. Um, he came back to it again a decade later when he realized that the evidence was growing that there was a cosmological constant. It wasn't uh, enough to zero it out. It was going to be even worse. You had to not zero it out and you had to leave behind this tiny amount. And so that's when he approached me to ask, well, how do we calculate the likelihood? And the paper Martel, Shapiro and Weinberg is the one that actually did it correctly and mm -hmm. predicted the anthropic prediction of the of value we now know Omega is 0.6 uh, is 0.7. So I it you you know you said it and therefore I'm here. I have to tell you get <laughs> it right, please. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. And in my next talk, I will add your paper in the 90s. I think that's, I, I, that's I'll, totally I'll write right. to you. I'll, I'll remind you by sending you know a, a link to it or something. Yeah, that's perfect. I, I, it's very, fair enough. Yes, I, I agree. And I think there was a, a simultaneous paper or close enough paper by George of Stathio, I think. You know, the paper by George of Stathio got something wrong. It had some of the same elements, but he didn't appreciate what Steve and I and Hugo Martel did, which is that you use the observation of the cosmic microwave background um, in a universe that is the only one we live in, Mm -hmm. uh, only not, not varying the cosmological constant in the universe we live in to change the initial conditions. You say, I solve for the initial conditions at the time of recombination, every sub-universe of any interest in this calculation actually had the same initial conditions. Um, mm -hmm. They just had a different cosmological constant, but it was utterly negligible then. 
if okay. you understand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. it, you know, it was the future when galaxies formed in okay. which it would pay, they'd pay That's a price for a yeah. difference. And got, uh, sorry, Scott, I, got that wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry I have to cut you off, but um, we need to get people to the uh, parallel session, so. Um, okay, well, thank you anyway, for coming anyway the call. wonderful really talk it. otherwise, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, that's very All right. good. All right, well, thank you very much for your talk and thank you. Okay, thank you.